Hello and welcome to Wes's RP Corner. The new intro that you just noticed is uh, courtesy of Jesse Dill, who is the Jess side of Wes and Jess. So kudos to him. Awesome. It's probably a lot better than this video is going to be. Anyway, today we are going to review Slasher Flick. In particular, the Director's Cut Edition by Spectrum Games. I don't have a physical copy of the book. I got the PDF because I just bought it for a party. But, uh, here, I'll put a graphic. Doo -doo -doo -doo. That should probably do it. Anyway, uh, before we get into the game, I would like to tell you guys a story. The story of the Glass Man. Now, the Glass Man, rumor has it, he was a mild-mannered glass paneler who would put the panes of glass on the windows during the Great Depression, and during a night of work while it was snowing, he fell from the top story of a mansion in a horrible work accident and died. Rather than pay the insurance money, the other workers made a very casual grave in the backyard and didn't tell anyone about it. And so... The glass man was born, and any time it snows heavily around that house, he rises from his makeshift grave and seeks vengeance for the improper burial that he was given. So let's fast forward in time to modern day, at the home of one Jack Astor, a entitled teenager with a lovely girlfriend, who is as to his name, a jackass, and he lives in this manor on the top of a hill where his parents reside, and his parents go out for the evening, so he decides to throw a big party, and it just so happens to be snowing on the eve of this party, and everyone's there, his girlfriend, who is a jealous girlfriend, she doesn't want anyone touching her man, uh, we have her dumb blonde friend, we have the hopeless romantic who wants to get with the jealous girlfriend, but she's obviously already taken. We have the AV nerd, another geek, a comic book geek, who were just kind of brought along because they're the brothers of the dumb blonde. And we have this paranoid, you know, aliens are real, Dale Gribble type, who just shows up for some reason. He knew the party was good. So we have all these characters in this house and this raucous party with music and slutty dancing. And the hopeless romantic, spurned, goes out into the backyard carrying the one red rose that he brought to make a testament of his love. And suddenly he dies against the snow, his back covered in shards of glass, the red rose Rolled in the snow, blood splattered everywhere. The AV, no, not the AV nerd, the other nerd and another chap are down in the basement playing pool. Suddenly everyone upstairs hears the ruckus. And they find one of them has been impaled with the pool cue and shards of glass down his torso. And the other one has had his skull broken over the edge of the table. And no one quite knows what's going on. They can ascertain that they are being attacked. Now there were a lot of great scenes, including a bathtub scene where the jealous girlfriend was trying to get a, take a bath to collect her wits. And there he was, the glass man, this leather face looking guy covered in shards of glass, emerging with his glass shards in his hands, throwing them like ninja stars. and trying to unpale her, but she barely gets away. And then there was a scene of her and Jack Astor going out into the backyard, and it just so happens that another guy was there, and there's the glass man. And of course, Jack finds the family, the Astor family flamethrower in the snow, because it was obviously there, and it malfunctions and explodes, and he dies. And eventually gets down just to three. The jealous girlfriend, her dumb blonde friend, and the AV nerd. And they found a van and they want to escape. 
but the van has trouble starting and the dumb blonde throws the nerd out of the van and sacrifices him so they can get away. And eventually they learn that the only way to defeat the glass man is to bring him back to his shallow grave in the backyard. And so they do, though the dumb blonde dies in the process in an epic battle at the tool shed. And finally the jealous girlfriend, her boyfriend dead, and all of her friends gone, is the lone survivor of this horrible ordeal. And this is all done impromptu via Slasher Flick. Now, Spectrum Games is this gaming company, role-playing game company, that specializes in genre emulation. So, they're very niche. So, for example, this is to emulate Slasher flicks, they also have stuff for, like, old 80s Saturday morning cartoons. Uh, they have a superhero one, one for Call of Cthulhu, one for westerns. They're very niche. And it's a small company, I don't think a lot of people have heard of them, which is partly why I'm making this review, to kind of spread the knowledge of their games, and this one in particular. So... What Slasher Flick is, is not meant, I don't think, for long campaigns. This is meant for your one Halloween party, or those one days where your normal GM is either burnt out or tired, and someone's like, oh man, I just saw, you know, the 8th, Friday the 13th film, and you know, I'm really in the mood, let's make our own Slasher movie through a role-playing game. So that's kind of what this is for. This is for Halloween parties. And stuff of that nature. The Glass Man, which was my first run, was at a Halloween party for my, you know, role playing group during college, and we even managed to rope some people who weren't really into role playing, and just kind of gave them a character, and it was great. I'll explain how you can do that in a little bit. So what this game does is. It breaks down the genre for you very well. The first chapter is all about the slasher flick genre. And I kid you not, there are four pages of tropes. Or things that commonly happen. And then there is an exhaustive list of movies that you can and should watch for inspiration. They really break down the genre for you, especially if you're not familiar. I remember the first time I read this book. I did not know Black Christmas was a thing, and I watched it after reading it, and I really liked the movie. You know, Black Christmas is supposed to be the first big slasher movie. Star of the genre, apparently. According to this book and other sources I've found. So, what's interesting about this system is you have three types of characters. You have your primary characters, you have your secondary characters, and you have your tertiary. Tertiary characters are basically... NPCs, you know, the little guy, the old man who says, don't go into the woods, there's the guy, you know, those kinds of people, or the parents who don't believe you. Secondary characters are pretty much there to die. They don't have to die, obviously, but their mechanics are scaled down to the point that often in these movies, there's a lot of cannon fodder, and they are the people who represent the cannon fodder. Now, these are shared between all of the players, or they can be. There are various ways you can handle this, but the model they suggest in the game is that you have them kind of in a pool. If they're relevant to the scene, then, you know, one person can play them, or you can share them, and they're usually these very trope-specific characters, but we'll get more in detail about that. Then you have your primary characters, who are usually your main characters. You know, your main protagonist, the love interest, the antagonist, you know, those who are probably going to last either until the last one or the second to last. You know, the guys who the movies kind of build up around and that they'll probably die, but maybe not until the very end. So they're mechanically a little superior. Now, each of these characters, you know, they have their stat block and they have four attributes brawn brains finesse and spirit and you have a rating in each of these poor normal or good now what's interesting about this system is it's sort of a dice pool system it's kind of like fate where you roll a set amount of dice 
the unlike fate, it fluctuates. So, for example, if you are poor in something, you roll four d10s. I think. I'm not quite sure. If you're good at something, it's four d4s. And the only one I'm not sure of for normal is if it's d6s or d8s. Those are both kind of in the middle there. And whenever you are trying to do something you can fail at, what you're looking for are matching numbers. So, if you get, you know, two fives, then you succeeded. Simple. It's a relatively simple system. And if you get the top number, that also has different effects depending on what you're doing. Now, characters also have, like, these little advantages. For example, running away. If you're really good at running, you can get an extra die in. And then they also have, like, flaws, like scaredy cat. If you're trying not to freak out, and there is a freak out rule, uh, you take a die away. So it's usually one plus one minus trade-offs. And then you usually have some random equipment based on your character archetype. For example, a cell phone, but probably won't work because this is Slash and Flick. Uh, and then what's interesting about this game is the killer, who is your main antagonist, he does have stats, but they work kind of interestingly. They have components, which are things like mysteriously vanishes, or hard to kill, or has a favored weapon, or a favored environment. And if they are in this favored environment, or have this favored weapon, or doing certain things, that affects, you know, your person's role when they're up against them. Now, the way you combat this thing is a kill scene. Now, a kill scene happens when the killer is up against one of the characters. And what happens is the characters start at a survival total. For the very first kill scene, if you're a primary character, you get a score of 1. If you're a secondary character, you get a score of 0. And you basically narrate a series of roles of what you do. For example, if you're running away from this killer, you, that would be a finesse roll. If you're trying to get a bat on the floor to clunk him over the head, that's brawn. Now you roll, and various modifiers affect this. If you succeed, you gain an amount of survival points depending on how well you did. If you just succeeded, you get one. If you succeeded with toppers, which for d4s would be two fours, d6s would be two sixes, etc., then you get one point plus one d3 worth of survival points. And your goal to survive the scene is to get up to eight. If you go under zero, you're dead. So, for example, reaching for the bat, if you failed that roll and you were a secondary character and that was your first thing, you're dead. And either you or the GM can describe how you died. So, it's a pretty visceral game, and after you succeed a survival scene, you get to roll a d6. Now, the killer can only be affected under certain circumstances. When there are a certain number of people, they are considered to be invigorated. So, they're really hard to hurt. And each killer has a set number of damage tokens that they can sustain before being defeated. Now... When there's only like one or two people left, they are exhausted, and they're much easier to kill. Because now they can take damage pretty much. Whereas before, you would need double toppers, which are like if you had four dice, if they were all sixes, then you could hurt the killer. But in this case, if there's two people left, especially if you're the last one left and you're a girl, you get huge bonuses to this, and you can take the monster down easily. Which emulates how in movies like this, you know, once it's down to a few people, the killer is now vulnerable and easier to take down. For some reason, we don't know. Now, the final interesting thing I want to talk about in this thing are genre points. You get genre points by acting like an idiot in this game, and that is hilarious. For example... If you go off alone, you get a genre point. If you scream at something, you get a genre point. If you do stupid things like, say, let's split up, or you don't finish off the killer when he's down on the ground, 
you get genre points, and you can turn these in for some pretty wacky effects. For example, in the uh, story I told you, the Aster Family Flame Flamethrower, there is one where you can spend a certain amount of genre points to say, that's exactly what I needed. And you can say, any object is there that you need. In this player's case, it was a flamethrower. <laughs> for some reason. I love the guy. Uh, and then there's also another one, which is like, oh, you're here, where you can summon any other character from your primary and secondary characters. Just summon them up. It's like, oh, look, you're now in the skill scene. Congrats. Take the blow for me. So it emulates some of these weird things that happen in these horror movies, and you get them by acting stupid like in a horror movie. There's a lot of buy-in that you need to play this game well. But it really, really works. Now, what do you get in this set? You get all the rules for creating characters, for creating killers. You get tons of genre advice. You get two adventure hooks. This is the director's cut, so it has a little more than the uh, original. You get one long, really fleshed out movie that you could play. That would be good if you're just getting started on this and don't really have a big grasp of the rules. But the best thing you get with the director's cut is about 30 odd pages of pre-made stereotypes. Like the dumb blonde. Basically for this Halloween party, I gave everyone one character. If they were lucky, they got a primary or a secondary. If they were lucky, they got a primary. If they were unlucky, they got a secondary. We were all just there for fun. It didn't take long, so if you died, you just kind of watched the rest. And it was really entertaining to watch, unlike most role-playing games. Being a voyeur, it's not a voyeur sport. You all know that. But, uh, so that's where we got these stereotypes, and they are statted out exactly as you'd expect them to be. And it was great. And you get, like, 30 pages of those. It's amazing. So you hardly, there are rules for creating your own, but if you really just want to run this really quick, just, there's even killers in there. Pick a killer, throw out some characters, you're good. And you just let the game kind of narrate itself. So do I recommend this? Yes. Would I recommend this for a long campaign? Not necessarily. But I would recommend it if you want a quick, visceral, fun, genre buy-in game that really emulates the niche it's going for. So yes, I wholly endorse Slasher Flick. And get the director's cut so you get all those extras. It's great. So this has been Wes for Wes and Jess Games. If you like this video, please like below. If you want to see more videos like this, subscribe. Talk to me. Comment below. Tell me other games you would like to see me review. Tell me topics you would like to see me rant about. And other than that, this has been Wes for Wes and Jess. I hope you have a wonderful day.